Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Anna Breeze. Is that how you say it? Breeze. I'm going to say Breeze because it sounds good. So, <laughs> first of all, Anna, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, not a problem. You used to work for BBC, ITV. I was at ITV for a long time and uh-huh. BBC for about a year, year and a half. Mm-hmm. And I left, uh, I, the last job I had at the BBC was called BBC, I was a producer of BBC X-Ray in Cardiff. And uh, we were, I was working on a consumer program and they actually called me. So I was on a contract and they called me about a year after I'd done, done a short amount because I had a child and begged me to go back. And um, and I didn't go back and uh, I haven't worked for the BBC since and I haven't worked for ITV since. And that was about 2010. Missing it? <laughs> no way. So <laughs> you were a journalist. But you left the mainstream media because you weren't getting to expose the truth of majority of your stories. In fact, every story probably. I'm not going to go down this narrative of good guy, bad guy. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. There were a lot of fantastic journalists out there. Um, I found in the TV newsroom that there were a lot of TV journalists who were very focused on, I found that they had very low self-worth and the ego and, and getting the views and the likes and the following was very important to them. And And I always used to say this, whenever we used to do a TV news bulletin live, people would always rush back and look at what they looked like because you'd you could be able to see it straight away. They weren't going off to a dark pub in Birmingham. So I worked at ICV in Birmingham. They weren't going off to a dark pub to meet a whistleblower, you know, or get a true story. There weren't any investigative journalists in the TV newsrooms that I worked in. That's ICV in Birmingham, BBC South Today in Southampton. They were not investigative journalists. They were, I mean, at the end of the day, when I started doing TV news presenting, it was more like acting. It, there was not a lot of journalism involved. Mm-hmm. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a place called Nuance in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, in the rougher end of Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire is an interesting county because it's got a very posh part, which is called the Cotswolds, and then it's got a quite deprived area called the Forest of Dean and um, a little market town there. And I've I've watched a couple of your interviews and I've noticed something. George Galloway and David Icke, some of your more high-profile yeah. guests, both of them had a very uh, poor childhood, and I did. I did. I did, didn't have any money, no money at all. My dad was a secondary school teacher, and my mum didn't work, and we were really poor, really, really poor. I remember wearing the same dress to school every single day, and it getting so worn, it was see-through, and never had pocket money, never went, never really went on holiday, toys, um, very basic presents at birthdays and Christmas, but um, didn't bother me at all. Big and that's why, I've, that's why I don't care about money now. Did you have a big family? I was one of three, older brother, younger sister. Um, I was born in 1976, and uh, so I'm 42, nearly 43. Shouldn't say that word to that out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was a time when things like how I looked and how old I was and pretty I was and how confident and beautiful I was mattered and now everything's changed and I'm um I'm fighting I'm a fighter I'm an activist and I'm living in a world I'm living in a world that uh, concerns me mm-hmm. greatly and deeply and I'm probably on a path on a journey similar to yours James and I've listened to you we've had a little chat before this interview and I'm um so excited to meet people like you that are doing what what I'm doing. Honest journalism. Well. I think anyway, sometimes I talk a lot of shit though. So, <laughs> so I do sometimes I go sometimes I go I talk and I go, you sound you sound like a genius. And other times I go, nah, you're a fucking psychopath. No, we had a chat on the phone before we met and I just thought, yeah, you're spot on. And you were talking a truth that I hadn't heard from many people. And it just completely resonated with me. And I just thought, yeah, you're you're bang on. And I'm I'm now working. So from the BBC ITV, working in TV newsroom as a presenter journalist. Now I'm enabling and helping people like you. Mm-hmm. But you are, okay, you come across very well. You're attractive. You've got a good, you know, setup here, three cameras. I'm helping people that have just got a mobile phone get their truth out on social media. And let's scrap the word social media because it's not. It's not social media. It's not happening in a social environment. It's new media. It's incredibly powerful and it's getting the truth out there. And that's why you're so successful in Scotland. It's why you've got 44,000 subscribers on YouTube, mm-hmm. massive following on Facebook. Um, it's because you are 
representing people, you are speaking a truth that they're not hearing um, on the traditional old media, mainstream media outlets. Yeah. So how did you get involved with journalism then? What, what chose that path for you? Well, back then it was simply a case of I was working at Rothschild's Bank in the Channel Islands, which I hated. I was making very rich people even richer. And I thought I was 23 and I was very unhappy. And I'd kind of followed a path that my parents sort of said to me I should follow. And I just thought, no, I'm 23 and I've got to finally find a career that I'm really going to enjoy. So all I wanted back then was to meet people, lots of different people, listen to their stories and have a varied, you know, an enjoyable career. And I I enjoyed it and I loved it and I was a very good journalist. And uh, it's only really been the last two, three years as I've been investigating and I've been listening to people and hearing different stories that I've I've become a bit of, um, I've become disruptive. Um, I've become a nuisance. I've become angry. And I've become um, distraught by the fact that there's a truth that's not being told. And I'm not the journalist that I was. And I went into journalism probably a little bit for the ego. I was very badly bullied at school. And um, and I noticed a couple of other girls, it's very similar stories that we had in the TV newsroom as female journalists. We would been either made to feel in some way inferior and we needed the glory. We needed to feel special. And I got that from TV news. And, and that's why I really pushed and pushed and pushed. And I got a fantastic career. And I got to a stage where I was one of the lead presenters at ITV in Birmingham. And, um, you know, you get the fan mail and it it gave you a boost and you needed it. And it's the same way, and I have to constantly check myself, in the same way if somebody comments or shares my post, I get that boost again that I need. Yeah, a dopamine boost. Yeah. So you, do you know, I did go into a career where I was just working in an office, I don't know, a secretary in a, a solicitor's office. I was in a career where I needed it. I needed that feed. Mm -hmm. I needed to be, that. I needed to know that I was great. But if you've been bullied at school and stuff and you're starting to get recognition and people are starting to give you credit, make you feel good. That's that's a good thing also. But I had worth. It gave me worth. The worth that I I was missing. And I was horrifically bullied at school. It really was horrendous. It was really, really bad. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of the reasons I was drawn to that career and I pushed and pushed and pushed. What was it like then working for the BBC back then when your career was thriving? What was it like? What was it on a daily basis for you getting up in the morning what was your well I'll, I'll mention now just to plug my book making the news i yeah. talk a lot about working in the newsroom in itv and also when i went to the bbc and how the newsroom works how we get our information and how we um, publish that information so when i went to the i was at itv in birmingham i was one of the main presenters and itv me regions were merging so they were having to save money. A lot, Not a lot of people were watching ITV local news and it wasn't making any money for them. So they were merging. So the West Midlands and the East Midlands region, they were going to merge. So they were going to go down from 11 presenters to three presenters. And I was one of the 11 and I thought, this ain't happening. I've got to get out of here. Um, I'm not going to be, I might get one of those jobs because I was very good, but there's a chance that I won't. So I meant, managed to get a presenting job at BBC Southampton and there were so many people went for that job and I got it and I knew I was going to get it. I was I was strong in the interview. I had did a great um, screen test. So I went to work for the BBC. I was pregnant at the time and I used to do the late shift. So I'd start work at 1 p.m. and I'd finish at 11 p.m. So I would um, help if needed for the 6 p.m. bulletin. But I wasn't needed. So do you know what I did? I walked around Southampton uh, looking for baby clothes. I'd go on the internet pretending to work. There was nothing for me to do. That was the situation it was. So there was nothing for me to do. Once or twice I got sent out on a job. Then I'd have to present the roundup, the one minute news roundup. I think it went out at 7 or 8 p.m. And then I'd have to edit. So as soon as the 6.30 programme, so... ITV, it was 6 p.m. BBC, it was 6.30 p.m. As soon as that program was broadcast, I'd have to re-edit it for the late news. So I'd have to sub it right down. So I'd have to take the top stories and re-edit it, 
cut it right down into sort of seven minutes for the late news. And that would take me a little bit of time. I couldn't do it until it was broadcast. So the 6 or 6.30 p.m. news bulletin was broadcast. I could then do that. Sometimes I would help with the overnight. So our ITV news, we did something called the overnights where you'd write the morning bulletin the night before. So you've got breakfast bulletins at 6, 7, 8 a.m. They're written the day before. And so I'd help with those. At BBC, there were more staff. So I'd say there were 30 more, three times more people at the BBC than ITV. So I would then help with the overnights at ITV. BBC didn't need me to do that. So then I'd just work on the late news bulletins. There wasn't a lot of journalism involved. It was literally just, right, what's the, what's the top story here? Edit that two minute 30 package down to one minute 15. And then I would do the bulletin and I would be in a studio a bit like this, three cameras, no one else would be in there. There's a camera one, do your link, camera two, second link, camera three. And I'd have an all, a pedal, a bit like a sewing machine pedal, and I'd read the auto cue. And then I'd, can you reverse the auto cue? Does it reverse or does it just? It's go live. Forward? I'm 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 filming. I'm it's broadcast live. Yeah. So see when it goes forward, the auto cue. See if it goes too fast. Can can they put it back up? Not in the evening bulletins because you don't have a producer in the gallery. Mm -hmm. So in on the six p.m., which is the flagship show. You do have someone to reverse if, if you've got a problem. They're controlling the auto queue. But in the evening bulletin, the late news, which I used to do, you had to control the auto queue yeah. yourself. And this is really important. And this is going to interest you. We've got to be very, very honest here. We, in an era, I don't know when you were born. I was born in 1976. We had a situation where we had four or five channels on the TV. We had to have TV news in a half hour segment, didn't we? Because otherwise we'd be watching news all the time. We didn't have TV news channels. We didn't have it on all the time. So they had to put it in a half hour segment. So you'd have a presenter link into a package, presenter link into another package, finish with the weather and a bit of an and finally. What's wrong now in 2019 is that as a total anachronism, it's in the wrong context, in the wrong decade. We have now got multiple platforms and multiple channels. How does that half hour program still exist? It's wrong. It doesn't make any sense. You're, you're editing down five minute interviews into 15 second sound bites. You're packaging them into two minute news bulletins. And I used to do these, so I was a reporter as well. You'd interview some of the five minutes and you take 15 seconds out of it. Well, the public now can listen to the five whole five minutes and make up their own minds. Mm -hmm. See, when you're getting told to do a story, I believe if you watch the news long enough, you're going to end up depressed because it's all negative stories. Did you ever see that when you're working at the time going, this is fucking draining me? The complete opposite happened at BBC in Birmingham. So I had a boss, and this is in my book, Making the News 2018, which is on Amazon. Uh, I had a boss called Liz Hannam. I think she may still be at the BBC. I'm quite happy to, to be very open about this. Um, we were working in the newsroom that day, and working in Birmingham, there were a lot of murders, there were horrible stories. There was a beheading, um, there was a child murder, there was some kind of arson, really horrible stuff. And she said... We're not going to run with any of that today. We're going to run with lots of positive stories about the about this area, about the Midlands, because we want people to feel good. Mm -hmm. So I, she chose the stories for the day. She wanted to put across a more positive um, kind of feel for, for the people taking their half an hour daily media diet for regional news that mm -hmm. night. Because you are what you watch, you are what you eat. So if you're constantly watching negativity, that brain is going to constantly repeat that cycle. I believe there's goodness in the world. I believe that everybody's got goodness in them in some way. But if you're constantly watching negativity, murders, rapes, suicides, wars... Well, you'd, you'd agree with her then. You'd make a good producer. Yeah, but how can... But she would have ended up getting sacked eventually if she was to stay, do that more than once every day. Instead. But I, I, the funny thing was, as a citizen living in Birmingham, I wanted to know that someone had been beheaded. Um, I knew there was horrific stories and children had been murdered and all these horrendous stories. But she said, we can't lead with that story after that story, after that story, after that story, after that story, because it's miserable. Mm -hmm. But that was what happened in Birmingham and the Midlands that day. Because she says, obviously, it's about ego stroking when you're getting good stories. It's the negative shit that sells. My biggest view is on this podcast as gangsters. People want to watch the guts and the glory and the misery. Did you tend to see when you were working for the major corporations that you tried to look for the most negative story because you knew it would have the most views? 
you had instinctively knew what would sell. Mm-hmm. So you would always find the headline, the soundbite. Um, so you, if somebody cried, you'd always put that top. So the producers and my boss used to say, always put your, your top shot at the top. Mm-hmm. So if somebody cried or something, you know, really distressing happened. So no, it was, but no, you'd have incredible stories where people rallied round and they'd do wonderful things. And that, that would lead the program as well. So it was it was wonderful news, a positive where people had um so, so for example, I did a story about there was a, a, a couple, an elderly couple that were burgled and all of their life savings, their cash life savings were taken. And after the report that I did, loads of people um donated money. So and we ended up replacing what they'd lost. And that was a great story. That was uplifting and that did really well. And people responded to that positive story. So f- you loved your job at one point. So when you were doing and un- you're uncovering stories and doing what you've done, what was your catalyst to waking yourself up and and then want to leave? What was the turning point for you? Um, I left because I had kids and um, I was doing a late shift, so I was working from one till eleven p.m. That doesn't work when you've got kids. And I ended up getting a fantastic job for with the National Union of Journalists, like an admin job. And um, the opportunity to kink came to come back. But I cannot and will not ever work for BBC again. You know, just on Jimmy Savile alone and how they covered up that paedophile who continued to abuse children under their nose when they knew what he was getting up to. Yeah. How could I? How could I? How could anyone? You know, that was my walk away moments. And and not just Jimmy Savile. I've I've spoken to a number of people over the last couple of years. I um I started seeing a guy who was probably what um, a lot of your audience would know about this. The tr- he was in the truth of community. Okay. So he used to talk to me about 9-11. And when I first met him, I thought he was mad. I actually thought he was mad. I thought he had he was mentally ill. Yeah. I thought, what? 9-11 was an inside job? What the hell are you talking about? And he'd show me stuff. And a lot of it was crap. Excuse my language. It was. But some of the stuff he was saying to me challenged me. And it did. And I have to remember that girl who I was three years ago that started to see this stuff on YouTube. And I know YouTube's got a lot more restrictions nowadays. But he started showing me some documentaries exposing the truth behind 9-11. And ITV actually did a feature on 9-11, which was very interesting. Kind of blamed it on the Saudis. And that was um, that was quite enlightening. And it was like, yeah, but that's YouTube. It's just on YouTube, and you're mad. But then I would, I'd listen, and I'd, I'd argue with him, and I'd talk to him, and I'd listen. Of course, I would. I was open minded. If somebody presents me with evidence, I'm not just going to go, no, 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 that's crazy. Mm. So I started to watch some of the stuff that he was watching, and I started to open my mind to these some of these issues. You know, do aliens exist? What happened to Princess Diana, JFK, 9-11? Mm-hmm. Um, conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories, yeah. And um, at that time, they existed in his, his domain and in on YouTube mainly. But over the last two years, I have met people who are challenging things that have been reported in the mainstream media that are even more blatant and even more serious and even more concerning. For example, uh, I've spoken to a chap at length and interviewed someone called Robert Stewart, who's for the last five and a half years, he's a former journalist, looked at a BBC Panorama programme called Saving Serious Children from 2013. Um, All I would ask is any of your viewers to go and have a look at that because it appears that the BBC filmed uh, an event, a fabricated event, um, with with victims that weren't injured at all. Um, very, very serious indeed. Uh, and other things have happened. So I've been very involved in, in covering the Westminster paedophile cover-up. So it ex- accelerated and accelerated. So I met uh, somebody who started to, to pose these questions and show me information that challenged my beliefs. And it was a very difficult time. And I didn't listen to it. And I didn't want to know. Cognitive dissonance, they call it. Scary as well. To think Scary. That going down. It's like, um, I mean, Jimmy Savile. I wrote to Jimmy Savile four times. I wanted to be in general fix it. And it's, 
I really thought he was cool. I thought he was a lovely guy. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, no, he's not a lovely guy. Rolf Harris, I loved him as well. And the same thing, you know, what, are you telling me I can't trust the BBC? And what they've told me about 9-11 isn't true. And it's a quite a gradual process. So don't be disheartened if you start talking to your family about stuff and showing them information. And they are in shock to start with. It's a, It does take a long time mm -hmm. to start to challenge these situations to start asking these questions and start to change your view about establish it. things that you trust. You know, you think at the end of the day, the BBC, especially for my generation, they've been in the living room, our living rooms, like a member of the family. Mm -hmm. Their television sitting in the corner of our homes, teaching us a truth that we trusted and believed in, almost like a member of the family, an auntie or an uncle that comes into your home every single day that you listen to and believe in. What's our program? The you, go, you, yeah. you, you, you're going to start to challenge and, and, and question that. That's going to take some time. Well, it's called a program for a reason because it's programming your brain. It can program your brain. There's subliminal messages in everything also. McDonald's advert pops up. So all of a sudden you're hungry and you're driving to McDonald's. There's so many different factors. Again, we spoke about it earlier. Unless I see it with my own eyes, it's still a conspiracy. There's always three sides to the story. One day you want to be a journalist, you think that's the right life, and then other you meet you meet someone else and they present something, you go, fuck, wait a minute, this is crazy. But we live in a very soft generation where people are scared. Let's, if you're going to well, have the, the problem we've got, okay, the truth of community, and I'm mm -hmm. very happy to talk about this. The flat earth stuff, I think that's absolute nonsense, drivel mm. and damaging. You know, <laughs> well, let's talk about David Icke, who you've interviewed. Mm. I think he says some fantastic stuff, especially around education. But he said the Queen Mother turned into a 12th at Lizard or something. Mm. You know, you've got stuff. Uh, crisis actors, there's a lot of the truth of community think that every single terrorist event, every single shooting involves crisis actors. They're not real. Mm. I don't believe that either. And unfortunately, that community can do a lot of damage as well. But, you know, you're, where do you find your truth? Where do you seek, search for it? Where, where do you, you stop? Where do you seek comfort? And where, where do you, where well? do you trust? Because it's a never-ending fucking rabbit hole. You can constantly search and search and search. Just that mean you're talking, you necessarily might be right or wrong, including myself. You've got moon landings, you've got 9-11, you've got constant... I think sometimes in life as human beings... We feel as if something's missing. So when we see this shit, it kind of gives us a wee bit of, oh, that could be right. It kind of lightens up our brain a wee bit where it becomes a wee bit excitement. What do you think about the moon landings? Real? Fake? I don't know. Do you not know? Should look I at... don't actually care. Yeah. Do you know what I care about? <laughs> I care about child abuse. Mm -hmm. So every I've got um, 14,000 followers on Twitter. I've got 300 messages I haven't even read. I'm getting stories from people who have um, been the victims of the most horrific corruption and, and conspiracy of injustice and abuse in the workplace and professional people as well. Children in care homes, but professional people in, and they've gone to the ombudsman and their ombudsman has got a, a very dodgy deal with the institutions as well. And that's, I've experienced that and, I've ex and I'm hoping to expose that in very different, many different industries. And these are people with these incredible stories to tell and they're not being told. So my solution to this is to empower them. So what I'm doing is traveling all over the country and I'm trying to do more and more free work, charity work, enabling these whistleblowers and victims of survivors of abuse, giving them the tools to tell the stories themselves, to get them out on social right. media, just like you have to the masses. Why has that become so important to you, the paedophile rings and to expose them? Because children that don't have a parent who have been, you know, for example, you know, I've, I met Michael Tarragher, who you've yeah. interviewed. So he um, was left to the hospital as a baby. His mother was a prostitute. Um, he was one of twins and he was abandoned at the hospital. And she also dropped off the two-year-old sister. He was then in the care of, of the council and of the authorities. I think the first three years of his life, four years of his life, were okay. And I think that's why he is the man he is today. But at the age of four, he was taken to a foster home where he was only raped every single day. Now, that little boy, I still I see in that man. And who who's going to be his parent? Who's going to look after him? And what if that's still going on today? Hmm. How bad was the Jimmy Savile stuff at the BBC? How bad was the cover-up? I know that there's someone called Miriam Jones who's spoken and it's been published in one of the mainstream news, I think it's The Guardian, but also the Press Gazette. Miriam Jones was a producer for BBC Newsnight. 
He's come out publicly. He lives in Wales. He was a BBC producer for Newsnight. He's come out publicly and said that everyone on the right side of the Jimmy Savile situation was viewed as traitors and, and removed. So basically, when that story broke within the BBC, there's a programme that BBC Panorama um, produced called What the BBC Knew. So the BBC Panorama were investigating BBC Newsnight. Very interesting programme. You can still see it on YouTube. So the BBC investigating itself. And a lot of the executives within the BBC refuse to be on that programme. They're the ones that are still there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The ones that came out and said, wait a second, why aren't we doing anything on, on Jimmy Savile? And they'd been talking about it for years, investigated him. All of the evidence was there. All the witnesses were corroborated. Um, two source, BBC need two sources. They've got two source evidence for all of it. And this BBC was still failing to push it out. The people that wanted that Jimmy Savile exposed, they were the ones that have been that were pushed out, made redundant. The people that were weren't traitors were kept on, and so I would look at that. That what was interesting, what happened with the Jimmy Savile story. The reason it came out in the end was ITV sent the BBC um, a press release saying we've got the information we're going to we're going to publish, and they forced it. So it was. Um, it was the it was ITV because they're very close and they they keep together and they protect each other. ITV forced it, so they thought right if if ITV are going to tell one of Jimmy dead, Savile's a pedophile, after we're going to have to. After he was dead, of course it was after he was. That's dead. what I'm saying. So don't get me started on Epstein. You know, do you know what I mean? So what is the Epstein story? What the fuck's the script with him? The suicide was that murder? You think? I'm basing everything I say on the information that I have heard. Mm -hmm. I don't know Epstein. Um, what I'm very interested in is the WikiLeaks e email documents, um, you know, the Podesta emails and the Clinton Foundation. And I was watching was John Pilger and um, Julian Assange YouTube video yesterday and I had 80,000 views and I thought, this is outrageous. This should have 800 million views. Julian Assange talking about the corruption within the Clinton Foundation. Um, and, you know, Bill Clinton supposedly was on Jeffrey Epstein's private plane 30 times. You know, Prince Andrew was his mate. Prince Andrew was seen. This is what's interesting. Prince Andrew was seen in Jeffrey Epstein's house in 2010 after Jeffrey Epstein had the conviction for child paedophilia. Um, why was it only released now, 2019? That video has been sitting somewhere. And probably there are newspaper editors and TV editors who are holding on to information uh, about individuals, keeping it back. Why did they release it now, nine years later? Oh. And that was what forced Prince Andrew to make a statement about Epstein. It was only when that video was released nine years later, 2019, filmed in 2010, mm -hmm. that Prince Andrew then finally, because the, the royal household, the royal press team generally don't make any statements but it was so bad, that video. This is why this video is so powerful. So I would say to anyone watching, if they're a victim of abuse or injustice, film it, okay? Even if you don't publish it, you've got it. So, so Jeffrey Epstein, Prince Andrew was at the door of Jeffrey Epstein's house two years after he was convicted. A convicted paedophile. And when that was published, that video was published, that's when it was all over the media and Prince Andrew was forced to make a statement. But I don't know what happened to Jeffrey Epstein other than that I, from what I have read and the evidence I have read and watched and, and gathered, I believe he is, he has a lot of, he had a lot of information, a video one of high profile individuals, possibly Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, possibly Trump, who knows, of them in compromising situations with young women. Yeah, it's fucking sad. It's very sad that this is going on. Will we, will it ever come to a head when everybody will be exposed? When somebody comes to the forefront and really puts the pressure on it, especially the mainstream media. I think it's like four or five families run the media all around the world as well. So. Well, we've got to stop calling the mainstream media for starters. Mm -hmm. What would you call them? Well, how many views have you got in Scotland? How many? Millions. How many? How powerful are you becoming? Millions of views. Exactly. But then I become. So, a what are you? Alternative people. media? No, you are the mainstream media. So, what happens when you get more views than all of the mainstream media channels? Are you called the mainstream media? I think so. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
So don't give them the power of that label. Change your terminology. Everybody that speaks out about paedophile rings or everybody that tries to expose that, a.k.a. Jill Dando, I believe was going to do a, a documentary on paedophilia, was going to expose a lot of people, end up dead. Does that scare you also? Yeah, it does, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was Jill Dando? Was she going to expose a lot of stuff? The rumours are uh -huh. that she was going to, and I probably should crowdfund for a, a, a proper full investigation and documentary into her. I would have Because I feel like Jill Dando, so she died in 97, I believe. She, I feel like Jill Dando with a Twitter account, okay? Jill Dando with a voice. So back in Wales, I know two people who are friends with somebody who, um, who worked in the, the police force, and they said that she was, yeah, she was murdered. It was a hit mm. job because she had information on, on paedophiles. Um, what, what, I'm very happy to talk at length about the paedophile ring. What I would just say briefly to your viewers is the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, the official inquiry that the government launched, all of their interviews with high-profile former senior police officers, testimonies on oath back in March, there's about five of them, they all testify that they were told to cover up anyone, VIP, actor, paedophile, uh, sorry, actor or politician seen in a compromising position with young boys. Was that, so the testimonies are on YouTube, the ICSA live stream and the ICSA videos, they're called the ICSA Westminster hearings. They've got about 300 views, okay? Because it wasn't in the mainstream press. Unfortunately, that story hasn't really been pushed out. However... What happened to Carl Beach, a.k.a. Nick, was everywhere. Carl Beach was the guy that got convicted for, for being a liar and a fraudster and a paedophile who made accusations about um, higher politicians and, and particular individuals. So he was everywhere. But there were, there were no journalists at the ICSA hearings apart from every day, apart from someone I know called Mark Watts, and I was there as well. So what there's information out there, yeah? That we're not get that we're not hearing. Mm -hmm. So I've done everything I can on a small pl platform that I've got to try and get this information out there. Um, but do I think Edward Heath was a paedophile? Yes, I've spoken to Michael Tarragher and somebody called James Reeves, Mike Veal, Chief Constable of Wiltshire Police, who led the investigation into looking into whether Edward Heath, the former Prime Minister, was a paedophile. I know about him. I don't know what's happened to him since he tried to lead that investigation and lead the truth. It was Edward Heath a paedophile. You asked me what I can say and say, say with conviction. I believe with conviction, our former Prime Minister, Edward Heath, was a paedophile. One other thing I can say with conviction, I believe BBC Panorama um, have produced programmes that have uh, displayed very dodgy journalistic ethics and they've had an agenda and they have presented lies. And I'm happy as a journalist to come forward and say that. They could sue me if they like. Yeah. I've got enough evidence to support those statements. Has anybody ever came forward, a friend you worked with, and says, what the fuck are you doing? Take a step back. You're going crazy. No. My friends talk to me about waitress closing or who's going to win Britain's <laughs> See, I would say they were brainwashed more than anything. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, we'll touch on the Syria thing again. For people who don't understand that, some people call that a false flag event where they'll set up a war zone or they'll set up a school shooting where they'll, they say people have been murdered and what happens is like stuff like Saddam Hussein, um, Gaddafi, they say they'd set up, they said Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction but again, they never ever found any weapons of mass destruction. What they wanted was the gold, poppy fields, money, oil, Stuff like that. So when you watch the news, people believe with this mud stick. So, so, well, look what happened in Saudi Arabia and the journalist that was murdered in the embassy. You know, I believe, I'm going to be wrong, but in Saudi Arabia, you can be stoned for being gay and they're our friends, yeah? Hmm. We're not going in to overtake that regime. What about all the... But, but we did with Hussein. I see it, right, these countries all around the world, because I studied anthropology. What's that? That anthropology is the study of culture. So and smart. Preservation of, of, of whatever society you want to create. Mm -hmm. So I live on a street, okay, and there's all these different houses and all these different families in these houses. And I think to myself, that could be Syria. 
That could be Iraq. That could be Afghanistan. Now, there may be a dictator in that house that I don't like, and I don't like the way he's speaking to his children. I don't like the fact that they have no freedom. But do I have a right to knock down their door and shoot the, shoot the father? It's not up to me, and it's not my choice. That is, the, that is a society and a system that they have created. Do I go in? And what is my real motive, actually, to go in? You know, is it to do with, with the resource, the natural resources of that country? You know, have I been given some kind of motivation? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I was talking to somebody who, who knows someone who works at BAE Systems, and they've said that they're feeding, they're giving alms to Saudi Arabia and what's happening in Yemen and the huge starvation in Yemen, children dying of starvation. It's because of the money that they're giving to, to Saudi Arabia. But I am not an expert on this. I'm an expert on Westminster paedophile ring i'm expert on that mm -hmm. talk to me about that i can talk to you at length i could talk to you about the people i've met face to face like this mm -hmm. you know journalists who've worked for itv and national newspapers who are trying to expose it i've talked to victims of, of 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 politicians i've spoken to them face to face you talk to me about saudi arabia or syria or weapons of mass destruction i, I was in oxford when the david kelly story broke and we all, I mean, I've I've spoken on a forum at ITV Central News. We still have a Facebook group. And the cameramen have come forward and said, that was dodgy. George Galloway actually said he's making a documentary about David Kelly. Good. Is that the boy who suicide? David Kelly. Shot was, himself in the head yeah, or something? Yeah, he was a weapons inspector. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, 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 they alleged that he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. You know, they alleged that Epstein committed suicide. And it's very difficult because people are only seeing these conversations and this news on the alternative media and they're waiting for it to be validated by the mainstream media, mm -hmm. but it never will. You've got to be convicted and you've got to not, not be scared of shame. So you just said to me, has anyone come forward and said to you, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. No, they're crazy. Yeah. No, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's they because, are Yeah, crazy. I know what you mean. I, yeah. Everybody, we're all on different paths. We're but it takes a while. Paths. Don't expect it to happen overnight, okay? Mm -hmm. I saw how it happened with me. That guy I met, 2016 started showing me stuff about 9-11 and it took me a good couple of years. So you always have to remember the person you were mm -hmm. when you heard this information and you've got to be very aware of cognitive dissonance and how difficult it is to untrust. That's a word. Mm -hmm. Untrust something you've trusted. Mm -hmm. And again, five years from now, it might be something totally different. We've just got to try and enjoy the path that we're on now. Also, when you're digging into that kind of stuff, do you ever feel drained? Tired. Incredibly drained. And when people say to me, I mean, I went to see a counsellor because I was suff I was struggling. I was really struggling. And they said that I had taken on the trauma of the abuse victims. I was mm. so when you hear sad stories all the time and you empathize, you can end up carrying it. You have the trauma, you experience the trauma. Mm. And um, you know, I, I try my best to to take a break. But at the end of the day, if children are being abused right now, which I believe that they are then that that's far worse than than what I'm going through. How bad is it now compared to the eighties and nineties when Savo was about and it was more the Well at least say say you're a victim you're a child and you're a victim of abuse. One that you've got um some power in that you've got a mobile phone and two you've got a place to to, to publish your footage. Mm -hmm. So you've at least got that outlet to get out some kind of truth. Um but you know if you look at the story of former Scotland Yard detective John Wedger or Maggie Oliver he was exposing, you know, ch children, teenagers. So John Wedger talked about in central London how he found children in ch children's homes who were going missing every weekend. They were living in foster homes or care homes. And he found that they were being groomed by pimps, got onto Class A drugs, basically being pimped out. And when he raised it with his boss, he was threatened. He said, you've uncovered something we don't want to get out. You're going to lose your job, your family, and your home. John Wedge's stuff is all over YouTube if anyone wants to listen to his testimony. So this was back in 2005. This was happening. So that's not that long ago, is it? Children in care. So Art, your question was, is a children in care right now in London, age of 12 to 14, 15, being groomed, being pimped out, and are they, are they being sexually abused for money? Yes, they are. Still extreme. Still, because a lot of people are speaking out about it now. A lot of people are getting hope from the people who are speaking out. Michael, 
yourself. Well, the, the paedophiles didn't all just disappear in, in no. 1995, no. The scary thing is, they're saying one in every 30 has got paedophile tendencies. One in every 30, that's one in every street. Do you think there's enough things in place for paedophiles who maybe have the thoughts to go and do what they're going to do, but is there enough things in place to them get help? Well, this is the thing, stop, you know, if they if they had a place where they could go and say, look, I don't want to be like this, I need some help, but they're vilified, you know, they're villains and stuff, and they, you know, they may have been a victim of, of, of child, child sexual abuse themselves. They, I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I've never had a paedophile contact me and say, well, this is my story and please help me. I, I don't know. I don't, honestly can't answer that question. Yeah. So what do you think the biggest cover up then in the BBC has been so far from paedophile rings? Um, what would you say allegedly that you think was the biggest cover up? But still getting covered up to this day. Well, I guess Edward Heath, Edward Heath, the former yeah. prime minister. Um, How bad was what, it? What they've done with Jimmy Savile, and I always bring, always say with these examples, bring them back to the family. So if you had a close friend, you found out they'd covered up for a paedophile for years, and that paedophile had continued to abuse children. Would you continue to be friends with them? No. So why do we continue to to trust the BBC? And that's fact what they did. Have they covered up for Jimmy Savile, yeah? Mm-hmm. But it's never went to court. Because well, he's... Dead. Because he's dead. But could they still not bring it to a trial? So were the victims coming and speaking, no? I don't know whether they got compensation. I mean, you see lots of other people of, 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 of getting, finally getting justice is coming out about... I know there's another Heath who's involved at Chelsea Football Club and, um, you know, the Catholic Church and different private schools... You know, they are putting certain people out there and saying they were a paedophile mm-hmm. and uh, they're getting, they're getting, um, they're uncovering this mm-hmm. now, See, I, good. I worked with a man called uh, Terry Mullins on one of my podcasts. There was a boy who was charged with murder. Terry Mullins gave the boy a lie detector in prison and his mum, both of them passed. Uh, he's got equipment now, which is a, an eye test, also the polygraph test, where it's 100% accurate. So I'm think I used to say I said to him, do you think they should use these tests in schools for teachers for priests to ask them a question are they sexually attracted to kids? I think it's something that should be done because the numbers seem to be rising. It seems to be getting worse. But I feel as if people who work with kids should be put under a polygraph test and ask them are they sexually attracted to kids? I agree, but let's. I mean, a one hundred percent. But I, I'm focusing on making sure if you are sexually abused, or if you are a victim of abuse, you go to the police. Like Michael Tarragay ran to the police when he was six years old and wasn't believed. One, we raise awareness so people are aware that this is happening. But two, that they do have an outlet and a platform to tell their stories, and which is your, what you're giving people. You know, you're giving people a chance to tell their stories. And I'm training people with their mobile devices, giving them a chance to tell their stories. So... You you can bully someone, right? So this woman that I know called Jan Cruikshank, she was working for an organisation. She was sexually abused. She alleges that she was raped. She had a very small Facebook following. She's an easy target. She's got nowhere to tell her. She, she can't come back. So the boss that did it to her kept his job and she lost her job. But now she's got a big Twitter following. She, I've taught her how to do video with subtitles. She got 600,000 retweet reach last week. She... She cannot be silenced, yeah? Mm. This is what's so wonderful now about new media, is you cannot silence. So if you are being abused, or if you are being bullied, you have a chance to come out and say, well, you can't do it, because I'm going to talk to James English. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to talk to Anna Brees, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to build my following, and I'm going to get this story out there, and we will find out what you did to me. Because you've, you do videos now, you help people build their social media from videos. How can people get in contact with you for that? So I've just, um, what we're trying to do, so I met a victim of, of horrific child sexual abuse called Michael Tarragher. I helped him publish his book. And every single penny from that goes to help in training people. So I ran a course last week, which was completely free, accommodation, food, training, all paid for for two days in Birmingham um, for people that probably called the TV newsroom with their story, but the TV newsroom didn't want to know. 
So I'm going to show them how to get past it and do it themselves. So these courses I'm running, all people need to do is please follow me on Twitter at Brees Anna, B-R-E-E-S Anna. So Twitter's quite a big one. Or they can contact me via my Facebook, uh, my my website, which is www.breesmedia.co.uk and my email address is on there. Mm. So if if they want to get in touch. So, you know, we obviously hope to sell more books. And Where can people get your books? We'll plug it again. On a, that would be fantastic if you... If yeah, you no, we'll put the links. We'll, well Michael's them. book's called Meat Rat Boy. Mm-hmm. That's on Amazon, independently published, I might add. Mm-hmm. And making last month uh, £300 a month. Mm-hmm. Just completely we just did it ourselves. I think that'll grow. I think the more the story gets told, I think more people will... Well, every single penny then will help other people mm-hmm. tell yeah, their Yeah, the story, money that's made from these wanted. books go towards the victims, which is a good thing. Yeah. What is your what the fuck is your main outcome then? What because this is a never ending chain for you, this is a never ending line. If you're you're deep into this now, it's this is never ending. Do you know what I mean? You went too far deep, you, there's no turning back. So what is your goal then? I've come out publicly and and called BBC Panorama Liars. And that's got eighty thousand views on Twitter mm-hmm. plus. I've I have can't go back and work for the BBC, that's for sure. Or I T V. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I do sound and look and uh, create videos that are just like the BBC. You sound like a BBC. I am um, interviewer. I, I was I was good. I'm a really good. Presenter. You are good. The fucking presenting. Presenter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could film and edit. Not as well. good as me, but you you try. <laughs> is uh, so. What's it? So we'll be going back to the BBC. Let's yeah. put it that way. And uh, while the corporate communications training uh, continues, I'll because you're very good with your words, allegedly, supposedly. See, I don't. I'm you need to write. This is very important. Like, show me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Watching this, whenever somebody makes an accusation, go and ask them for a right of reply. Okay. okay. So you say, um, "So and so has accused you of this, this, and this." I'm doing it with someone called Victoria Ash at mm-hmm. the moment. She was in a BBC panorama in 1992 called "In the Name of Satan." She said Martin Bashir lied to her before she was uh, contributed, and also that she asked for her identity to be removed, and it wasn't. So. I've done the interview with her. I haven't published it yet. I've gone to BBC Panorama, BBC Press team and said, these are the questions and accusations. Please respond by Wednesday. If you don't, I will say you make no comment. Always put in the other side. It makes you look better and it makes them look worse. Right. And that's so, how you do it as a journalist. So, so all the accusations I've made today, you know, about BBC Panorama, at the end of the programme, you should turn to camera and say, well, we have contacted BBC Panorama for a response to the allegations made by Anna Brees, oh. and they have uh, declined to respond. Which we have done. Um, so end product, end goal, are you trying to create as much exposure as possible for these beasts? for these paedophiles to get them shut down and to stop this. It's like a society. It's like the higher powers. It's like, yeah, uh, are keeping it quiet. It's like, a, I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's for people who don't know the hierarchies of the... I want all those dark, horrible lies, all that injustice and abuse that's hiding in the shadows for a big light to be shone upon it. And mm. we're going to do it. Yeah, I like that. So moving forward for the future... What's the plans for you? Carry on doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And thank you for talking to me. Not a problem. Anna, would you like to finish out on anything? Allegedly. Buy, book, buy the book Making the News by Anna Brees, Making the News 2018, Meet Rat Boy by Michael Tarriger, and please follow me on Twitter because it's growing and um, we're not social media anymore. Not yet, but we are the fucking media. Peace out. Anna, pleasure. <laughs> Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you.